All right. Uh, moving swiftly on, I uh, have the pleasure of introducing our third speaker, Catherine Mills. Catherine is professor and director of the Monash University Bioethics Center. Uh, she holds a PhD in philosophy from the ANU, our university here. And uh, she rose through the academic ranks at universities in Sydney before moving to Monash University. And Catherine's main research interests lie in the areas of biopolitics and bioethics, especially in relation to technologies of reproduction. So thank you, Catherine, for joining us. Thank you, Thomas, for that introduction. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here today and um, very honored actually to be presenting alongside um, my co-panelists. Just getting my screen organized. Um, so I'm going to begin today by talking about how lucky I am or acknowledging how lucky I am. I'm lucky to live in a country that has a relatively good healthcare system. I'm lucky that unlike millions of people around the world, none of my family have died from COVID. I'm also lucky that I've been able to get four vaccinations against COVID, all free, I might add. At least one of these was a Moderna spike fax, so thank you, Melissa. We all know that COVID vaccina that vaccination status makes a huge difference to the likelihood of severe, serious or fatal COVID infection. Yet there's still many countries in which rates of, of vaccination are low or where a large percentage of people are only partly vaccinated. This, of course, is not simply a technological problem. It's a problem of social, political, and economic structures and ways of doing things. So my task today is to pan out and look at how RNA therapeutics fit within or potentially transform these structures and some of the ethical issues that arise from doing so. So in order to do that, what I'm going to do is start by comparing or talking a little bit about the difference between RNA and DNA uh, therapeutics and then talk more about the disruption and ways of thinking about responsible innovation in relation to RNA therapeutics, and particularly touching on these two issues of equity and the contrast between public and personalized medicine. Now, as Thomas said in his introduction or indicated, this is not really my full area of expertise. So the first thing I did when I started putting together this paper was to go to my favorite database, uh, for ethics research and look at what has already been said about RNA therapeutics. As it turns out, you can see there's 118 papers in this database on gene editing and ethics. In terms of RNA therapeutics and ethics, there was none. So that wasn't very helpful, but it was somewhat instructive. So I then went on to have to do a little bit more research of my own, comparing DNA uh, therapeutics to RNA therapeutics. And it struck me that there's some really interesting contrast here that Melissa was already beginning to indicate as well. So one of the really key differences is the question is the difference between permanence and transience. So this has really significant implications for thinking about things like safety and, and efficacy. So in terms of safety, you have a much uh, reduced risk of off-target effects with RNA. You also have no, you know, there's a kind of significantly reduced risks of ongoing uh, harmful effects, which is uh, for, for DNA editing um, or therapeutics is really quite a significant concern, especially when we're talking in terms of um, inheritable genetic modification, uh, which then has, has risk for generations uh, henceforth. So that's, that's not going to be a concern for RNA. So, in terms of safety, we know that gene editing has a, has a patchy uh, safety record. Um, we don't yet know whether human uh, inheritable genome editing is safe or not, um, but we know that RNA techs are going to be safer, um, uh, and we've seen good evidence of that so far. In terms of efficacy, well, we don't yet know whether gene editing will be efficacious. We know that RNA therapies are or can be. We also know that RNA therapies are much more uh, usable insofar as they entail much more mobile manufacturing processes and so on that Melissa was already indicating. So there seems to be 
some really significant advantages to RNA as opposed to DNA-based therapies. But at the same time, there's still some really interesting social and ethical issues. And I think it's at this interface of how technologies are brought into existing and uh, existing social structures and how they change those social structures that actually make a huge difference to how we can actually really harness the benefits of these technologies. So what I think we need to begin by recognising is that RNA therapeutics are really quite disruptive for our current medical system. Um, we need to recognise that they're part of a broader trend toward the integration of scientific development and entrepreneurialism. entrepreneurialism. Now, they're not unique in this way. This has been happening on a large scale. It's part of a general process after the Human Genome Project of monetizing and making valuable biological materials. As Melissa says, it's making your body treat yourself. So you can see it in a sense as enhancing the biological and economic value of specific molecular processes. So it's also not unique in, that, in the kind of integration of science and entrepreneurialism. And I do want to emphasize that this is not bad in itself. And in fact, it may be a good thing insofar as it leads to more breakthroughs, more scalable health solutions that, than might be achieved with publicly funded science. However, this integration of science and startups gets particularly interesting, I think, when we're talking about innovation in therapeutics because then we get into really core questions of how we distribute the social good of health. So we get questions like who gets access, who pays, and really, ultimately, what do we owe others when it comes to health? So one framework for thinking about these questions has been through what's called responsible innovation. And this is a way of thinking about the intersection of therapeutics with and how they kind of come into conjunction with, with social values more broadly, especially in relation to health policy. So it's a way of integrating health policy and innovation policy. So when we look at it through that framework, the key question then, I think, becomes what does responsible innovation look like for RNA therapeutics? Now, I'm not going to actually answer that question here, but I'm going to sketch out a couple of things that we might take notice of in trying to address that question. The first one of these is a question of equity. So we all know the best known success story of RNA therapeutics, and that's the development of the COVID vaccine. But impressive as that technology is, which it is in many ways, um, it's still only half the solution. The rest of the solution is getting it to people around the world. And that's where we run into familiar problems of global inequality. So pointing out this is not a critique of the technology, but it's just to say we have to recognise the way that new technologies intersect with, it, with existing structures and in doing so actually meet really practical uh, challenges. So there are, for instance, practical challenges in delivering vaccines that require freezing temperatures for stability to countries where the cold chain is, it, is already inadequate for standard food storage and transportation purposes. This is not a problem with the technology per se, but the way it interacts with social structures. So we can see then that there's a lot still to be done in terms of how we actually implement and utilize these amazing technologies. So the OECD, for instance, has really kind of developed a strong policy response that suggests that we need to be doing a lot more in terms of really developing that global coverage um, of, 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 of vaccination for COVID for the pandemic to get anywhere near being over. So the thing that I really want to point to though, and what's really interesting to me about RNA therapeutics is this, um, the contrast that we get between the widespread public health implementation in COVID vaccination, and at the same time, the really targeted 
personalized medicine that can be developed through, for instance, things like um, very, very individualized cancer vaccinations um, and treatments for rare genetic diseases. So we get this really interesting um, mix of being able to treat common diseases at a really broad scale uh, in public health measures. And on the, at the same time, the development of very, very individualized person, what we might call personalized medicine uh, treatments. And I find this really, really fascinating because it brings out something that is a really core value in thinking about health equity and access. And this is a question about how we think about um, the equality of people across the board. And in this, we can think about or, or look at uh, in-country COVID vaccination distribution. And we can see this in a way as really an example of um, egalitarianism at its best. So to think about COVID vaccination in terms of egalitarianism, we can see, for instance, that for this, everyone, regardless of their social situation, had access to COVID vaccinations, at least in theory. So thinking about a country like Australia in particular. So COVID vaccination was, a made, was made available freely to everyone. There were certainly practical challenges in actually getting it to people. So for instance, there was still inequities in access because of practical issues such as distribution to remote communities, which significantly affected First Nation communities in Australia in particular. But we can also see that there's a way in which the very fact that some people were given early access, those who were at, at higher risk, for instance, got to go first, that is itself a kind of principle of egalitarianism, that you make the worst off better before you uh, address everyone. There's also something very equalising about the fact that with the COVID vaccination, we all got the same dose, right? So it was a one size fits all in a sense. Um, it, 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 Fair, fair enough. Um, but there wasn't, it wasn't kind of personalised in any particular way. In a way, people became fungible. Um, we, it, it didn't matter who you were, you got the same dose. That's entirely different for personalised medicine approaches. So with individualised RNA therapeutics, for instance, we see um, so here I'm thinking about treatments for very ultra rare diseases, um, certain vaccinations for cancers and so on. These kinds of personalized treatments really challenge that egalitarian model of health resource allocation or health access allocation. So from a resource perspective, personalized medicine can pit individual well-being against broader social health. It raises questions about who pays who has access and how do we balance that unmet patient need against broader uh, public health concerns? So I think in thinking about the kind of personalized approaches that are being developed in RNA therapeutics, we can actually learn something from the established debates around orphan drugs um, that has been going on for some time. So in this debate, what we see is a real contrast between the costs of research and development, as has been pointed out, um, and the concern about marketability. So companies developing these drugs are just never going to get their money back because it just costs so much to actually develop them in the first place. And you might be then marketing them to very, very small numbers of patients. But at the same time, there might be quite significant unmet patient need in, in that these are severe diseases. They actually have a large impact on uh, public health systems and so on. So you've got to find some balance between those two things. Now, it's possible that RNA therapeutics will actually move us beyond that particular stalemate of orphan drugs. So it may be that we end up and I hope that we can kind of get to this position where RNA therapeutics can be both personalizing and equalizing for health. So here I want to uh, point to some really interesting work um, being done by uh, John Yu and the N equals one collaborative, uh, which is really focused on developing these personalized approaches to ultra rare uh, genetic diseases, but also 
thinking about how to equalize um, those, those therapeutics. And John, John Yu has some interesting predictions around what will happen, and in particular, thinking about the cost of new drug approvals. So he points out uh, that drugs currently uh, cost about 2.6 billion uh, to get approval and takes a number of years. Um, the question is, well, what or how can we get the cost of drugs down to a point where it actually equalizes medicine? And he contrasts this with, um, with uh, genomic sequencing and the way in which that has kind of come down significantly since the Human Genome Project. So, you know, as you will know, the Human Genome Project initially took about 2.7 billion to run the first, uh, uh, develop the first sequence. And now you can actually get genome sequencing for about $1,000. Still not necessarily uh, accessible by everyone, but certainly much better than it was. So can we get to that point with ultra rare disease treatments? That's the kind of question that we need to be thinking about. But if we can get to there, it's going to require whole system transformations. So there's going to be a need for things like um, much more rigor, uh, much more extensive data sharing and open development of drugs, changes to regulatory frameworks and clinical trial designs, the kind of built-in standardization of genomics uh, to all medical care, but also the changes in the manufacturing and delivery processes, and then right at the end, changes to how patients themselves interact with technologies and therapeutics. So there will be changes in how we have to deliver information to patients, what kind of consent is required and how that care is delivered right at the end. So I think at, when we look at that kind of whole system transformation that has to happen, it seems to me that there's an enormous number of really significant ethical questions that still have to be addressed to think about how we can fully harness the benefits of RNA therapeutics going forward. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you.